OK, so good morning again, everyone. Uh, we'll start now. Um, yeah, so welcome to E2212. This is matrix theory. Um, so before we begin, some general uh, guidelines are uh, let's keep our videos off. I'll switch off my video in a minute. I turned it on so you can see me uh, during the first class. I'll turn it off in a minute or two. Uh, and also keep your microphones muted. This will avoid uh, noise uh, into the into the class. And uh, if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. And uh, but if I don't see your hand raised, uh, just unmute yourself and uh, you can start speaking and I will answer your question. OK, so uh, before we begin, um, let's maybe discuss uh, the organization of the course. This is a new experience for all of us to attend a class online. And so we'll probably have to be a bit flexible and make things up as we go along. But uh, roughly this is uh, the outline that I've thought for this course. So this uh, this file itself has been shared with you um, in the teams. So specifically I'll show it to you in the um, in my teams. So if you go to teams, and you click on uh, the class uh, class team, and you go to files, and then class materials. Then there are two things here. One is this file that I'm showing you, which is the course outline, and the other is the textbook by uh, Horn and Johnson, which is the primary textbook I will be using for this course. OK, and uh, you will incidentally find uh, posts and other things related to the course uh, out here under posts and uh, some cr crucial announcements are in the announcements tab so that uh, you can have uh, you can have them all the announcements related to the course in one place. Um, OK. So coming back to the course outline. So this is E2212 matrix theory. And uh, in this course, basically we'll study the basics of matrix theory. And I'll also talk about some applications to engineering. Um, this is the course web page. And uh, typically I'll try to mirror all the announcements that are put up on Teams on the web page. But um, just to avoid confusion for you, all, all the announcements related to the course will be available on Teams so that you don't, don't read Really need to go out. Yeah, looks like I lost internet connection for a few minutes. Um, is can somebody confirm if you're able to hear me now? Yes, sir, we can hear you now. Yes. Sir. Okay, thank you. So, uh, incidentally, if um, uh, if I lose internet connection, don't panic. Just wait. Uh, hopefully, uh, the internet will resume after a minute or two, and I will be able to reconnect with you. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so coming back to the course outline, the two TAs, Chirag and Nagbushan. Chirag, you're here. Would you like to say hello? Yes, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Chirag. Um, I'll be a TA for your course this time. Yeah. In Nagbushan, are you around? So both are excellent students, so you can ask uh, your questions and doubts to them also. Uh, there are going to be two office hours, which is going to be Tuesdays and Wednesdays. 5 to 6 p.m. and a problem session solving session which will be on Saturday 9 to 10 a.m. So the formal material of the course will be covered during these classes. These are additional times where you can get some help for your course, but it's not mandatory to attend these uh, these sessions. But of course, if you have doubts, um, this is a good time to get them clarified from the TAs. And also the problem solving session, um, there just won't be enough time to do a lot of problem solving in class for this course. And so um, if you want to see some example problems being solved, you should attend the problem solving session. For the grading of this course, I currently have a tentative plan of having two midterms and a final in addition to quizzes and assignments. And all four parts will have equal weightage. I'm also debating whether to have one midterm and final and have a higher weightage for the quizzes and assignments. That depends on how easy it is to administer and uh, grade an exam. 
Um, so we'll uh, we'll decide that in a few weeks' time. But meanwhile, the, this is the tentative plan that your quizzes and assignments will be worth 25% of your grade. And uh, the two midterms and the final will all be worth 25% of your grade. Now, um, one thing I realize is that uh, given the pandemic situation, it's uh, necessary to plan for the possibility that um, some of you may fall sick, uh, unfortunately, during the uh, time which we have uh, fixed for the exam. And so this is going to be my policy. I, I don't want to have uh, re-exams. And so if you miss an exam because of health reasons, then you do need to submit a letter showing that uh, you were indeed sick and that's why you had to miss a test. Um, and in case you miss one test, then your points from the other two tests will be used to prorate your marks for the test you missed. But if you miss two um, or more tests, then you will get a zero on the test, the tests that you missed. And we will prorate based on the test that you've taken, but then your overall grade may be very poor. Homeworks uh, are assigned uh, roughly once in two weeks. These homeworks will not be graded and you don't need to turn them in, but we will have a quiz or assignment approximately once every week, which will have a problem, which one or two problems, which are very similar to the homework problems. These will be announced uh, in class and you'll have to turn in your solution um, within one or two hours after the class. So, um, and then the, there will be a series of assignments. We'll choose the best 10 scores to determine your score on these homeworks. Textbooks, I have listed four textbooks here. The first textbook is by Horn and Johnson. It's Matrix Analysis. Uh, this is the textbook I will be following uh, fairly closely. And uh, the other textbooks, depending on the part, for some part of the course I will for example, use Golub and Van Loon. Some computational aspects are covered better there. And Gilbert Strang is listed because it's a good undergraduate level textbook. So if you find Horn and Johnson a bit difficult, it's a good idea to go back and forth between uh, Horn and Johnson and Gilbert Strang. There are also a series of uh, very excellent uh, video lectures at an undergraduate level on uh, linear algebra. So I very strongly encourage all of you to take time to go over these video lectures. Um, and in fact, uh, for the most part, I'm assuming that you are comfortable with the material in these uh, video lectures. This is a graduate level class, so I, I will uh, basically summarize uh, things that you should know from your undergraduate uh, linear algebra um, modules. Uh, almost every undergraduate program that I'm aware of does have a part on linear algebra, so I'm assuming that you are uh, aware of this and you are familiar with it, and we will take go forward from there. Sir, we lost audio again, sir. We can't hear Your mic is muted. So you're muted, sir. Oh, I don't know how my mic got muted. How long ago did I get muted? Just 10 seconds, sir. Okay. Yeah, so I was basically done. I was just saying that the last part is the course outline, which you can look at on your own. Um, those are the topics that we'll be covering in the course. Um, so the first question to ask is, why should we study linear algebra? Um, there are two, uh, there are a few primary reasons that I put here, but I'm curious to know if, so I guess uh, I've already written the answers here. One, one, you know, one obvious reason is that this is required. So, you're, for example, if you are an MTech signal processing uh, student, then uh, you have to take uh, matrix theory. But it's also useful. I mean, after calculus and probability, or in addition to calculus and probability, this is probably the most useful mathematics uh, uh, that you can possibly learn. It's also very beautiful, and I will try my best to uh, give you a sense of that over the duration of this course. And uh, it's a, a topic of active research in its own right. So uh, building the background in linear algebra, if you are interested in doing research in mathematics, then certainly you need this background to even get started. And finally, uh, it allows you to solve very complex problems you, and uh, or prove very powerful results using uh, simple ideas. 
So these are some of the reasons why um, you might want to take this course. OK, so. What is it? What is it about? So finally, if, if I had to distill down, you know, the contents of this course down to what it is all about, it's just about these two equations. AX equals B and AX equals lambda X. So from your um, undergraduate linear algebra, you will recognize AX equals B is what we call a linear system of or a system of linear equations. And the AX equals lambda X is the eigenvalue eigenvector equation. So it's really about understanding these two equations and everything that you can say about these pair, these, this pair of equations. And that's what this, uh, this course is all about. So, but then it turns out you can actually say a lot about these two equations and um, what I will in fact cover in this course is going to be a, a small sample of what you can say about these two equations. It still will not be anywhere near being exhausted. So there are a few caveats I want to point out um, right off the bat. Um, yeah, so one thing is that in any mathematical course, uh, during the class when arguments are presented to you, it looks very simple. I, I can assure you of that, or it looks fairly simple and you feel like you understand everything. But it's very important to spend time outside of class from, uh, from day one. Um, you should look at the textbook, you should look for other material, you should try to solve problems. The class notes are not going to be enough. And uh, when you solve problems, you will realize that sometimes standard procedures don't work and uh, problems end up requiring you to look for some special way to handle some corner cases. And in some ways, it's also like learning a new language where we get comfortable ma making mathematical arguments. Now, the textbook for this course, uh, Horn and Johnson, is a graduate level textbook. It's a fairly dense textbook. It's actually not easy to read, um, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a, it's a, it has a, a very extensive uh, collection of results in the area. And uh, one of my goals in this course is to get you to be comfortable with um, Horn and Johnson because it has so many useful results. And uh, tomorrow in your research, if you need uh, more advanced results from linear algebra, you shouldn't have to hesitate to open the textbook and look for a result that you could possibly use. And that comfort is really what I'm, uh, that's really my goal is to get you to be comfortable enough with the textbook that you can open it up and look at it uh, whenever you need to. Okay, so let's begin. So uh, we'll begin with a review of some basic concepts. Uh, uh, again, these are concepts that you should already know. And so if you're not comfortable with the things that I'm talking about now, then you should check whether this is really a course that you want to take um, uh, or not. So a matrix uh, is a rectangular array of symbols. In, uh, in the context of this course, it's always going to be real or complex numbers. So I can write a matrix A as a collection like this, containing A11 as its first entry, A12 as its second entry, a1n as its nth entry in the first row, a21, a22 up to a2n, am1, am2, and amn in the last row. And uh, so this is what we call an m cross n matrix. And we write that this is in uh, the space real to the power m cross n or complex to the power m cross n if depending on whether these AIJs are real valued or complex valued. So always uh, when we write, the I is going to represent the row index and J is going to represent the column index. Now we say A equals B if all entry wise, all the entries of the two matrices match. So all the entries should be equal. When you do, a plus B, you can only do it if the two matrices are of the same size and it's an entry wise sum of the two, um, two matrices. That is the ijth entry of A plus B is the ijth entry of A plus the ijth entry of B. 
lambda is a scalar here. It could be a real or complex number. Lambda times a corresponds to multiplying every entry of a with this value lambda. Here's a simple proposition. A plus B is the same as B plus A. That is matrix addition commutes. And it also dis it's also distributive. A plus B plus C is the same as A plus B plus C. Lambda times A plus B is the same as you first multiply A by lambda, then you multiply B by lambda, and then add them together. Also, multiplying A by lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is the same as first multiplying A by lambda 1, then multiplying A by lambda 2, and then adding these two matrices together. Product also, this, this kind of rule applies. Next, uh, matrix multiplication. So um, I'll uh, start by talking about vector multiplication. So if you have a row vector, A1 to An, and a column vector, B1 to Bn, then uh, the product AB, these are two matrices, or two vectors that can be multiplied with each other. So this A is 1 cross N, and this B is N cross 1. And when I multiply them together, that's taking the sum of AI times BI, I equal to 1 to N. And so this is going to be a scalar. So with this, we can define matrix multiplication. If I have two matrices, A is of size M by N and B is of size N by P, then their product is a matrix of size M by P and it is defined such that its ijth entry is, the, is equal to the product of the ith row of A with the jth column of B. So I'll write this here. I goes from 1 to P, 1 to row index, so it goes to M, and J goes from 1 to P. OK, and uh, matrix multiplication is uh, very useful in many contexts. It's uh, at this point, I must mention that this is a strange way of defining the multiplication of two matrices. So, uh, for example, one could have thought of taking matrices of the same dimension and multiplying them element wise. OK, or you could think about a matrix product as you take a given take every entry of matrix A and multiply it by the whole matrix B. If you do that, you will get a matrix. When you multiply an M by N matrix with an N cross P matrix, you'll end up with a matrix of size MN by NP. Okay, so that 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 kind of product, it, uh, it turns out, we'll see that later also. It's called a Kronecker product. When you take the element-wise product of A and B, which can only be done if A and B are of the same size, then that is called the Hadamard product. But this is the usual matrix product as defined here. Um, it's a strange way of defining matrix multiplication. And at this point, the only uh, small uh, motivation I can give you, um, but we'll see much more later, is that it represents a composition of linear transforms. So as it turns out, um, a matrix uh, as I defined it earlier, is a rectangular array of numbers. But a more useful way to think about a matrix is to think of it as defining a linear transform. So a matrix A in, of size M by N is essentially defining a transformation from R to the N to R to the M. And any linear transformation from R to the N to R to the M can be represented as a matrix A. And if you take that viewpoint, then uh, a matrix product AB actually corresponds to a composition of linear transforms. So if you, for example, start with a, from a dimension P space, that is you start from R to the P, then multiplication by B corresponds to take going from R to the P to R to the N, and then if you go from R to the N space to R to the M space by using another linear transform A, which is another matrix of size M by N, 
then the joint effect of taking these two transforms one after the other can be represented by this matrix A times B as defined here. Another motivation I can give you is uh, we will uh, maybe much later in this course look at Markov chains and uh, <coughs> uh, it turns out that if you look at um, associated with the Markov chain is something called a transition probability. And uh, a Markov chain is defined by states S1 to Sn and the probability that you will end up in state J starting from state I in the next step is uh, represented as a matrix whose entries are Pij. Now if I ask what is the probability that I end up in state J starting from state I but not in one step of the Markov chain but after say P steps of the Markov chain then it turns out that this corresponds to taking the one step transition probability and multiplying it by itself P times. So uh, and that multiplication again is defined in this way as defined here. So think about it that uh, this um, this way of matrix defining matrix multiplication is really not intuitive, uh, but it's useful in a variety of uh, scenarios and that's why we define matrix multiplication this way. By the way, among the caveats, there is one thing that I wanted to mention, which is that uh, a lot of students I've seen have a tendency to think about uh, two cross two matrices or three cross three matrices in order to prove results. So when they're faced with a result, they would say, let me take an example. And then they take a two cross two or a three cross three matrix and show by example that whatever the statement they want to show is in fact true. Such a proof is not acceptable for this class. What we want is that if, if a statement does not say that it's valid for two cross two matrices only, then we have to prove it in the general case. We cannot show it in a two cross two or a three cross three case and consider that we are done. OK, so um, this matrix multiplication as written here is not commutative in general, meaning that <laughs> in general, AB is not equal to BA. In fact, AB may be defined. So here, as, as I've defined it here, A is M by N and B is N by P. So I can define AB, but if, uh, if M is not equal to P, I cannot even define BA. So in general, AB is not equal to BA. Okay, here's another proposition continuing on. AB times a matrix C is the same as A times B times C. In other words, um, which matrices you multiply first and which one you multiply later doesn't matter, but it is important to preserve the order of multiplication. That is, you cannot switch the order. You cannot do, instead of doing A, B times C, you cannot do C times A, B or some other order. Similarly, A times B plus C is the same as A times B plus A times C. And A, A plus B times C is the same as A, C plus B, C. Notice that again in all of these, we are preserving the order in which we are multiplying the matrices. So A times B plus C is not equal to B A plus C A, for instance. Another very important matrix we'll be using in this course is the identity matrix. This is denoted by I, and if this matrix is N cross N, and where there may be room for confusion, I may write I N to denote the N cross N identity matrix. It's the matrix that has ones along the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. And it has the property that A times the identity matrix, if A is M by N, then A times the N cross N identity matrix is equal to A. And the M cross M identity matrix times A is also equal to A. Transpose, taking the transpose of the matrix simply switches the rows and columns. So the ijth entry of A transpose is the same as the jth entry of A. 
We also define the Hermitian of a matrix or the conjugate transpose of a matrix, where not only do you switch the rows and columns, so it ij becomes ji, you also take the complex conjugate of the matrix. So A plus B transpose is the same as A transpose plus B transpose. The transpose of A transpose is the same as A. And this is an interesting result and it's something that you can try to show. That is, if you want to take the transpose of the product of two matrices, that's the same as taking B transpose times A transpose. How would you show such a result? You would take an ijth entry of AB transpose and then you would find the ijth entry of B transpose A transpose by considering an, a general matrix A and B whose entries are AIJ and BIJ respectively. And then you show that the ijth entries of these two matrices are matching. Another function that you can apply on a matrix is you can find its trace. This is for square matrices. So here it's an N by N matrix. So the trace of A is the sum of its diagonal entries. So another related result is that the trace of A plus B is the same as the trace of A plus the trace of B. This is obvious because the diagonal entries will add. And so if you want to take the sum of the diagonal entries, you can first take the sum of the diagonal entries of A and then the sum of the diagonal entries of B and then add them together. That's the same as adding the two matrices and then finding the sum of the diagonal entries. When you multiply A by a scalar lambda, then every entry of the matrix gets multiplied by lambda and so does all the diagonal entries and therefore trace of lambda A is the same as lambda times trace of A. When you take the transpose of a matrix that keeps the diagonal entries where they are, it only switches the off diagonal entries rows become columns and columns becomes rows, but then the diagonal entries remain the same. So the trace of uh, A transpose is the same as the trace of A. It's not true for Hermitian because when you take the Hermitian, you're doing the conjugate transpose. So unless the diagonal entries are real valued, the trace of A Hermitian is not necessarily equal to the trace of A. Trace of AB, so this is another interesting property that the trace of AB is the same as the trace of BA for compatible matrices, meaning matrices for which you can define both AB and BA. But considering that we are looking at square matrices here, when I define trace of AB, I'm assuming, I mean, notice that if I want to look at trace of AB, it's not necessary that A and B should be square. But AB needs to be square because trace is defined for square matrices. So AB is square and BA is also square. And it's such that you can find it. Uh, AB and BA are both defined. They, in, in that case, you can write trace of AB equals trace of BA. Again, this is something that is worth as a small exercise for you to try to show. And once again, the the way to show such a result is to simply write out what trace of AB will be in terms of the entries of AB, entries of A and entries of B. Write out what trace of BA will be in terms of the entries of A and the entries of B and show that these two things will be equal.